What's up, everyone? This episode is brought to you by Mantra Chain, the security-first, compliance-focused L1, which is onboarding the next wave of financial institutions. You're going to be hearing all about them later in the program, but for now, Mantra, thanks for making the show possible. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I am joined by repeat guest Quinn Thompson of Maple Finance. Quinn, welcome back. Great to be here. Happy Friday. Mm. Happy Friday, man. Happy Friday. I thought it'd be fun to just kick off actually with we're we're gonna we've got a couple of different stories here, but I thought it'd be fun to just kick off with Coinbase earnings, frankly. Um, Coinbase, I, I know you follow it pretty closely as well. I personally love following Coinbase just because they're the one public company that this industry has to be proud of. And it's you know, it, they're they're great to just cheer along, but it's also uh, I think you learn a lot about where we are in the cycle based on how Coinbase is doing frankly. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, I can walk folks through some of the higher level, higher level numbers, but then I want to get your sort of subjective take over that, Quinn. So, you know, the, the TLDR is that it was, was widely viewed as a beat, uh, both in terms of revenue and on the profitability side of things. I think Coinbase is trading. I mean, it, it spiked something like 20%, 15 or 20% after market. And I think it's trading somewhere around 190 um, right now. Which is great. Um, basically, the, the story is that that beats on the transaction and subscription services buckets of their revenue. So quarter over quarter, they grew uh, consumer and institutional trading from 274 to 492 million, respectively. So a huge jump in the consumer portion of their transaction revenue. And on the institutional side of things, they more than doubled from 14 uh, million to 36, which is great. So overall growth of... Uh, you know, more than 100% quarter over quarter growth on the transaction revenue side of things from 288 million to 529. Um, and then on the services bucket, we can get into subscription services bucket, we can get into some of the specifics here, but modest growth from 334 million to 375.4. The, the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to you is I, I think the real story here is on the, the profitability side of the business. So it was great on the from a growth standpoint, um, from a revenue growth standpoint, but really the big story here is what they did in terms of net income and EBITDA. So, you know, they went from Q4 of 22 losing 557 million in net income and 124 million in adjusted EBITDA to this quarter, you know, 273 million of profit and 305 million of adjusted EBITDA. So the full year results here in between 2023 and 2022 tell the whole story where revenue is roughly similar, 3.1 billion in 2022 and 2.9 in 2023. But in 2022, there was a loss of 2.6 billion. And in 2023, it's a $95 million profit. Um, So yeah, Quinn, what were some of your big takeaways from the earnings release? Yeah, I mean, the the year when you compare them side by side was was, was pretty wild. Like I've, uh, I watched the Brad Gerstner from Alt, Alt, Altimeter. He's, you know, the big tech investor. They do, they do venture, they do liquid. And, um, you know, he wrote that letter to Meta in Q4 2022, like time to get fit and has been a huge driver of like this, these cost cutting redu- reductions on Silicon Valley and, and software businesses as a, as a whole. But yeah, Coinbase, like minus, you know, dropped a quarter of their full time employee count, almost half of OpEx and close to doubled their their subscription service revenue year over year. So like positive EBITDA. I think that the thing we forget now that we're at 50K Bitcoin and and sort of back is like how bad Q2 and Q3 were for, for trading activity in the space. These were like two of the worst quarters in four years, like since 2020, pre before bull, bull run. So volumes are nowhere close to where people would expect them to be. I thought it was also interesting. They they kind of called out pretty good, like that seventy five percent of crypto trading activity is as derivatives and, and perpetuals, and highlighting their push. Obviously, it's all international at this point, just given the regulatory picture in the U.S. But I think Wall Street probably that's another area. Like they're going to slowly start figuring this business out. You'd expect, but that might be an area they they would be slow to just underestimating how important that is in the crypto landscape. And like, let's be honest. How many funds are Western oriented funds that trade offshore just to access better exchanges? And if they start taking those, that market share, just they never were in that market before. So um, I think it's a huge, huge beat. There's some other things. I mean, the Q1 guidance was massive. So they had 320 million in transaction revenue through 
halfway through the quarter, it, tough to extrapolate, but you know, that, that would be another like almost 15% quarter over quarter growth. Um, subscription services guiding to 10 to 30% quarter over quarter. Stable coins alone, their USDC supply is up uh, almost 20% this quarter from December 31st, you know, with rates at 5%, that's meaningful. And, and expenses not not really up. So I think the moves justified it to me, it looked like the most undervalued, you know, crypto equity of, of them uh, going into this. And it's, it's probably a little more fair at this point. But like you said, it's just everyone gets so excited, you know, around Coinbase earnings because like, can't pick a better advocate for the space, you know, fighting for, for regulatory clarity and things. So it's a fun, fun cause to rally behind. Yeah, I agree. And maybe to even rewind the clock back a full year to the end of 2022 to give you a full picture about what people were talking about back then. I mean, first of all, Coinbase had, you mentioned this enormous chunk that they took out of OPEX, which was mostly a headcount reduction. So they were burning money. They're the transaction part of their business, which Wall Street tends to not like very much, is extremely reflexive, both on the way up and the way down uh, with, the, with the rest of the industry. I, I would argue that that's, uh, there's a strong case that as bullish as analysts are starting to turn, and you could hear it on the Q&A portion of the earnings call, they're not being bullish enough on, on, <laughs> on just exactly how much trading is going to pick up. And I would expect them to, I would expect there to be a string of beats here where people continue to underestimate just exactly how much demand there is for this. And I think you called it out exactly right. There's That'll be on the, the kind of core platform for US traders, but I think the international segment is going to be massive for them. But the other thing that they were, that they were very concerned about back then was just guiding towards, it was kind of like a containment strategy, right? In terms of loss. And they were trying to guide towards what is the annual and quarterly loss going to be. And they've completely turned that around. And I think in, over the past couple of earnings releases, folks were really focused on the subscriptions and services part of the of the revenue bucket. And actually, last last quarter, for the first time, subscription services actually eclipsed the amount of transaction volume that Coinbase was doing, which everyone was really excited about. But I think this is just a pure profitability and revenue growth story here. Um, it just I think the the um, the idea amongst the analysts that cover Coinbase is that they really got their shit together from a cost-cutting perspective, but they've even been able to drive growth. And there was a, a pretty telling question from one of the, there were two questions from the analysts that I thought was interesting. You know, one was, you know, kind of this leading assumption of, hey, it looks like we're going back into a bull market now, which was interesting to hear. But there's another question about their, uh, their sales and marketing expense line item. And I, I thought this was going to be my assumption when this guy starts asking the question is, well, you know, why are you guys spending so much on sales and marketing? But he's actually asking, hey, it looks like we're going back into a growth time. Why aren't you spending more? Which I thought was, I mean, that's yeah. basically everything you need to know, right? Totally change, total change of tune. And yeah, everyone, you know, the talk on Twitter now is uh, like, are we back? Are we, uh, is retail back in? Because, uh, you know, extrapolating from their trading volumes. But the things I found most interesting is, so they had, 164% quarter over quarter consumer trading volume growth where US broader spot volumes were plus 90 on the quarter. So I think people are forgetting, you know, last cycle we had FTX, Gemini probably had a bigger market share. I, I, I haven't checked the numbers as detailed. That's something on my list for this weekend is a, a deep dive on that because they're kind of the only game in town. And, you know, like you said, dating back a year, a year ago, we were, you know, questioning if USDC was going to exist after the banking crisis. And, um, you know, it seems like they've really been able to take control of that strategic direction there and, and really effectuate positive change on, on the distribution of USDC. And then on the in institutional side, like 161% quarter over quarter, quarter revenue growth volumes, you know, match the spot volume growth of the market. So not, not a huge gain in market share there, but huge revenue boost from their institutional financing, their portfolio margining. So I think there's a lot of things under the hood on that institutional side as well with, with lended borrowers, you know, over collateralized stuff that, that people probably don't quite fully understand uh, that, that will be huge revenue drivers in the bull market without really adding much cost. It's, it's a pretty low margin once, once you're already facilitating all the, the assets and activity. So yeah, it's, it's good stuff. Let's see, um, you know, I think uh, the, the, the ETF cannibalization, just call that out actually, like, I think they made a pretty interesting point how it, it really hasn't 
like af- affected their flows or volumes. Like it's just additive to custody. You know, they're seeing some of the institutional spot volumes, but um, I mean, it's kind of proving that out with right with the new money coming in. It's uh, it's not like cannibalizing anything. So overall, people, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot to be happy about with this report. Yeah, I agree. I think you'd be pretty hard pressed to make the case that. ETFs are like the cannibalization is the thing that you should pay attention to. Although I do over a long enough time horizon think that might be worth paying attention to. And I do think the, you know, the part of the business that frankly is is maybe the most interesting, both from a, a non-cannibalization standpoint and also from a fee standpoint, is the international part of their business. So, you know, on the US and the US part of their business. Uh, probably over like right now, the ETFs are leading to a whole bunch of new flows. That's leading to, uh, you know, the price of Bitcoin and other assets going up. That's leading to more trading volume. That is unequivocally a net good. But over time, probably on the institutional side of things, like, yeah, there is a lot of trading that ends up happening on the ETF instead of the spot level. Like, it'll be interesting to see what happens on Fidelity, where you can either buy and hold the underlying or you can do the ETF. Like, I would love to mm-hmm. see the data from those brokerage houses. Um but uh, and, and I know that they talked about a little bit about some of the other ways that Coinbase monetizes ETFs. So it's not just custody, it's prime services, et cetera. But I doubt that's a big revenue driver, to just be honest with you, over the long term. But the international part of their business is just a completely different market, right? That is the, you know, generally, uh, I think that's like mostly perps, right? So kind of derivatives as opposed to spot, which is obviously less uh, subject to cannibalization. But also, I sort of feel like their fees are going to be very defensible in that part of the market because, you know, if you have to trade using an offshore, less regulated exchange, you're basically like, okay, let me like put my funds on here, trade as quickly as I can, then get them off immediately. And I feel like Coinbase is like, okay, having a trusted brand in that market, you know, you basically trust Coinbase much more. And I think I'd pay like twice as much to trade on Coinbase as opposed to the next shitty offshore exchange that I don't trust. So feel like I just want to, I think you're just absolutely right on that part of the business. So yeah, Yeah, the, um, I think where everyone gets it wrong or has historically gotten it wrong is just expecting that fee compression to come like ASAP. And I remember just all the bear kind of reports over the last two years when when people are taking uh, those kinds of views is it just, oh, the 2.5%, you know, spread is going to go down to 0.5%. And, but in reality, the, the amount of, like I, like I mentioned, like, crypto exchanges in the US is th- that people are using is kind of lower. And internationally, I'd be interesting to see like that international expansion actually might also be a huge driver of USDC adoption. Cause right now, right, like it's all USDT do- dominated. If you kind of, and one of the reasons for that is the utility of USDT, all these international pairs for trading activity are USDT facilitated you know, USDT, Bitcoin, USDT, ETH. Um, and so that's actually probably one of the bigger uh, competitive forces for USDC adoption, where all of a sudden, a lot of people don't care. Like when we speak to people on the lending side, they're like, yeah, we'll fund whatever. It's just like all of our trading activities in, in Tether. And so if, if they can effectuate inroads through their international expansion with USDC, that's probably a pretty big uh, boost to their growth on that front as well. So yeah, it's this conglomerate approach where they're able to really extract a lot of uh, operating leverage through through everything they're doing is uh, going to be hugely reflexive in the coming year. Yeah, I had a question for you on the uh, on the um, well, one of the things as well that's attractive about the stablecoin part of their business is it's sort of counter cyclical, um, like it did very well during an extremely low period of trading volume and kind of carried them. So I think that's another attractive part of their business. And I agree, I think stablecoin volumes are probably, our market cap is basically up only from here. Here's one that I was a little bit surprised about is this blockchain rewards segment. So this is, from my understanding, the uh, staking part of their business. And all right, so it looks good, right, on the on this line item, which is, it grew from 74 million last quarter to 95 this quarter. But I would have expected it to grow more, uh, frankly, just based off of the lift that they get from price appreciation in crypto assets. Although I guess this is mostly ETH denominated, I would guess, this line item. And yeah. ETH has kind of moved the least. Um, but it, it almost looks like they're not 
it kind of looks like this business isn't really growing. And anyone who's listening, who works at Quinbase, like, please correct me on this, but it kind of looks like this is basically just the effects of the price lift. Um, but I've always thought people sleep on this part of their business. Like they're massive in the, in as a, as a staker or so. I think this is an yeah. easy item to watch. It is, it is mainly ETH. Um, I, I, I bet it's probably like, I don't know if they break that down, but it's probably like 80 to 90% ETH denominated. Maybe, maybe so one of the interesting, um, on their trading volumes, it's on here. I, if you scroll, uh, I think it's down from this. You'll see that Bitcoin and ETH as a percentage of their total trading activity fell. Uh, yeah, it was 38 and 19 in Q3 to 31 and 15 in Q4. And that other line item grew almost 15%. I, I'm guessing that's mainly like Solana. Obviously, retail coming back, it's, it's everything but Bitcoin and ETH. You know, they're, they're trading everything. Um, but I, I would imagine it's a lot of uh, alts and, and Solana in there. So, but yeah, that staking, um, I mean, the staking market's competitive. Like there's, there's, there's a lot of players going after it. So I don't know wh- how much you assign to like, it's kind of a price appreciation story. It seems more than it is like an assets under custody story. So, you know, you start maybe just to, to start to wind down this part of the conversation, I mean, what is your overall th- and Coinbase, the stock, by the way, um, has done extremely well and is up. Um, I don't even know the percentages. I'll get them, but it's absolutely ripping from here. Do you think uh, like we've seen like that stock is fairly priced where it's at? Um, have we seen a lot of the growth already? Does it still have a pretty bright future ahead of it? Like it feels like my mental framework, at least, is that we're in the in the early innings, maybe inning three of this of this new bull cycle, maybe inning three or four. Um, and yeah, just wondering like what your thoughts are on coin moving from here. Yeah, I think that's right. It's um, it's less of a bargain as it was uh, two weeks ago. But I, I do think like, let's say from today's date, it outperforms Bitcoin over the next year and, and, and probably ETH, it, yeah, out, outperforms Bitcoin and ETH. Um, whether right now is, is where you want to be entering after this, this type of weekly move. I mean, if it was up, uh, like 4% yesterday and, and like 12 the day before. So we're talking a, a, a pretty monster week. Uh, but yeah, I, I, if you're a long-term holder, I, I, I think you can find comfort in it and it, you know, you know, just the, the reflexivity to upside crypto activity. It's, it's going to outperform Bitcoin. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Mantra Chain, a security first compliance focused L1 blockchain that paves the way for traditional financial institutions to onboard into Web3. Now, I've talked about Larry Fink on this podcast a bunch. You guys have heard the clips, you've seen him on CNBC. He's talking about his Bitcoin ETF first, then his ETH ETF, and then he loves tokenization. And what that means is he's looking at the trillions of dollars of real world assets out there and he wants to digitize them and bring them on chain. And to do that, we need a compliant L1 that supports that and that's exactly what Mantra is. So they're positioned as the blockchain for tokenized RWAs and regulated digital assets. They offer high performance, scalable architecture, and they support both permissionless and regulated compliant applications, which is a pretty cool feature. They're built on the Cosmos SDK, so they've got IBC Interop and they leverage Cosmwasm for smart contracts. And they've got a whole bunch of cool features like Guard Mobile, Passportable DIDs, KYC and AML compliance, and the Mantra token surface. So this is relevant for devs. It's relevant for investors. Uh, definitely go check it out. Testnet Phase 2 is launching soon, and that'll unlock a whole bunch of new opportunities and dApps. So click the link at the bottom of this episode. Again, I get no credit if you don't click the link, uh, so that way Mantra will know that I sent you. So click the link at the bottom of this episode and go check them out for yourself. I'd love to get your thoughts on, sort of most updated thoughts on the Bitcoin spot ETFs. So... Uh, pull up this this chart, which is a pretty good resource for just tracking uh, flows across the entire Bitcoin spot ETF complex. And uh, so shout out to uh, farside.co slash UK. Um, but the, you know, the story is, I guess that the high level takeaways from this chart is the net inflows. So that's inclusive of the almost 7 billion of outflows from GBTC is 4.5 billion. So the total amount of Bitcoin uh, or of, of dollars that have flowed in to, this, uh, to these nine new Bitcoin ETFs is above 11 billion, but there is a, a big um, outflow from GBTC, um, but we're still at you know, plus 4.5 billion, which is just crazy um, given, the, the, given the span of time. And Quinn, do you want to guess what the 
you might have seen this on Twitter, but do you want to guess what the year to date flows are for gold ETFs? Trump, less than a billion. I mean, less than 500 million, probably, or negative. Yeah, it's definitely worse than that. It is negative. Okay. Uh, man, what did I get? Negative 2.4 billion year to date. Oh, wow. Um, which is. I mean, I mean, rates are up, so it's it's moving how you think it. I mean, Bitcoin's the outlier here. I, I, I'm not too surprising gold's down. So I'm not reading into that as much, but I am a firm believer that in the in the last market, you know, run we had, Bitcoin was definitely taking market share from gold books. Like it's 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 its most direct competitor. So definitely part of that is from from those capitalization probably. Yeah. What are your thoughts moving forward from here on, um, I've got some GBTC specific questions for you, but, you know, do you think the, you know, we've been seeing 500 plus million dollar uh, days in terms of net inflow for the last basically week. Um, so my question to you is, is this sustainable or, you know, what do you think about this? Yeah, it's t- I mean, I, I go back and f- I like, you can't be bearish. Um, it's just, the now that we've seen how good it can be and this is you know like pretty standard um like you know granted we're close to the launch but it's not like we just had a banking crisis or some huge outlying catalyst that that instigated it so now that the cat's out of the bag a little bit here it's hard to fade like i think maybe the biggest thing I'm I'm looking for is exuberance in the other parts of the market on the back of these flows. So with these, you know, five hundred million dollar days, we're seeing open interest on CME and perps increase, funding is higher. So the price appreciation is, you know, maybe one point five to two X uh what it would have been just with these flows, you know, due to people starting to speculate and add add long length to their exposure. Um, and that can always come, come down, which would be some selling, uh, if there's like broader, broader weakness or just, you know, pe- people got too far over their skis, but like, it's hard to see where like a 20%, 30% dip comes from it, that you might, you know, you're going to get something along the way, but, um, yeah, I, at these run rate levels, it's like a hundred billion plus, you know, annualized flows, 250 trading days a year. So, that that doesn't sound right um but even i just don't think it has to be that high like even 50 to 100 is like a really good baseline buying and then you get after the having and it's it's magnitude is kind of doubled so it's pretty impressive quinn can you break down the the supply impact that the having is going to have yeah i mean with the price appreciation so there's about $18 billion of, of annual supply hitting the market uh, for Bitcoin uh, being distributed to miners. Varying approximations of, of how much that actually gets sold into the market. Um, it, there's a reflective effect where the higher the Bitcoin price, the more profitable miners are and the less they actually need to sell to, to fund their operations. We are approaching, I mean, miners are like break even-ish right here. Um, none of them are still reporting profits from their operating businesses. They have some profits from Bitcoin gains on their balance sheets. So, but it's not like a horrible, uh, environment right now. Post having that 18 billion of annual supply gets cut in half. So it's 9 billion April and moving forward. That's a significant, you know, it's, that's a significant amount. It's, it's possible to argue that that would not have any effect, particularly when the existing supply of Bitcoin you know, 70% of that hasn't moved for a year. So um, it's not something that, you know, doubles the price overnight. It's, it's, it's you know, day by day. But, uh, you know, when you get exuberance and for whatever, you know, for now the third or fourth year or cycle in a row, you know, the halvings coincided with a good macro and everything else narrative. So it drives up price even further on that speculation. So it's uh, it's a meaningful reduction. And um, it's net negative for miners, but if prices are high enough, then then they can survive and be, be okay. Mm. Yeah, you know, we when we last talked, we must have been maybe a month out or something like that from the Bitcoin ETF yeah, going we're in live. December. Yeah. So, uh, 
you know, I think what we had talked about then was if, if the price runs ahead of all time highs or is like near all time highs by the ETF, then that was kind of bearish, um, right? Then we had gotten yeah. probably out ahead of our skis. And I, you know, what ended up happening feels almost like a Goldilocks type thing where we ran up, you know, to about 49K, we kind of sold off. Um, and now we're just trudging higher from here, but it doesn't feel like real euphoria has entered the market yet. Like one of the things, like that Coinbase earnings call where everyone is talking about retail coming back. Okay, there was a pickup in retail activity. Actually, the real indicator is where the Coinbase app is in terms of downloads on the app store. And people have been pointing out that that is starting to hop, but we're nowhere near. Like Coinbase was like the number one app on the app store for you know, six or nine months or something like that. So we're still a, a good ways away. But are you, I mean, how do you think about, are you pulling up, uh, pulling forward or pushing back, um, you know, where you think the real kind of euphoria and price appreciation is going to happen in the cycle? Because my sort of viewpoint on this has been, uh, it's going to be this slow, steady grind towards all-time highs. And then once the all-time highs come back, that would make sense to me that like, a bunch of media starts to write about it again and and retail comes back and that but like even if you just look at the rate that we're going i mean that's that's not six months away anymore that's like two months away maybe yeah it's hard to it's hard like it's so path dependent because if, if i think right here like i don't think we've really seen a parabolic move yet like this has been a, a tremendous run the last two weeks but like you said it's not it, it doesn't feel that fever pitchy, like leverage is high, funding is high, but those can go much higher in a bull market. So if we continue breaking out of here, I think like a, above 50 and, you know, towards 55, you start to get that FOMO, I think like, at least for, from a local perspective, you probably start to get people, you know, just, okay, like 50 is a big, that, that mental barrier. Um, where people would expect like some natural resistance. So it's tough to say. I've generally thought like <laughs> I turned bearish on the ETF day, hit it, I smoked it, kind of got bear hold a little. Like the ETF flows got me caught me off guard. I the Fed meeting, you know, that that went perfect, but risk didn't care. Uh we've seen a couple hot uh inflation prints this week. Risk doesn't really care. So I think you have to kind of go with that that sentiment um and and a lot of that this flow into the the bitcoin etfs i think is is just driven by a broader risk on in equities land so you know that that can reverse like there's definitely going to be a week this year where where etf flows go negative and you get kind of like a sentiment washout right as people are redeeming so i kind of still think like a q4 ish um which maybe would categorize as like sort of left left tail uh or left translated cycle like i do think just on the basis of like retail is starting to come back like people's traded this in 2017 at, then they traded it in 2020 like people aren't gonna fade it like they're gonna be quicker on the trigger once they see this thing moving than than past cycles is kind of my thought so um you just got to be on your toes and the, this, this is the tough part because if, if you're sitting on the sidelines and things grinding up three percent a day like it never is comfortable to buy in, but I think you, you cross that like 50 mid fifties chasm and yeah, it's, it's tough to fade that. So, um, let's see, like, I, I'm still a little skeptical that this pace, like I would expect the first signs of, of flows slowing down, even from 500 to say a hundred or 200, like creates a little hesitation or pause in the market. Um, but maybe that doesn't come for a month and, and we see something mini parabola in between. But yeah, you just got to take it day by day, man. These flows are like, you just can't fade it. I mean, it's, uh, it's relentless. And, and I actually, I think it's really bullish because my, from people I talk to on the ground, it doesn't sound like the banks and all these big wealth distribution oh. channels have really opened it up yet. So this is a lot of like probably macro or you know opportunistic hedge funds that that are adding exposure a lot of retail a lot of like um you know people's retirement accounts like pretty pretty grassroots i, I don't think this is like big broad um ria pushes so you'd expect that to probably start coming on say march april 
like, you know, slow, slowing the trickle there. And then like right around having it, it gets kind of nutty probably. Yeah. I, I agree with you. And actually I think a couple of different, these will all be anecdotal data points, but you know, I feel like we're at kind of the cycle where if you have a family member that works in crypto, you know, you're starting to text them, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, something like that. But like, generally, most people are completely unaware. Like, I, I, I think it's interesting. Everyone's like, I had physical therapy. And I was asking my PT yesterday, like, hey, like, uh, she knows that I work in crypto. And, hey, dude, uh, I'm rich now. Remember me? <laughs> no, 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 no. no, nothing like that. I, but I was just like, well, I, I, we were, she was talking. It's like, oh, is crypto like, is that still a thing? Like, is that back? And I was like, what I, I was like, what, what if you had to guess? And she was like, oh, I have some Bitcoin still. I was like, if you had to guess, what is the price right now? She's like, 25K, 20, 30, 30, maybe like people are just not, it's not even on yeah. people's radars yet. And I mean, another thing that sort of is taking a little bit longer this time that I'm surprised about is uh, funds. You know, it's, it's not like the funds are gearing up um, and raising a bunch of money from LPs right now. Like from everything I hear on the ground that it's, like if you're a great fund, if you're like one of these like A tier, you know, top five or or seven maybe in crypto, that fundraising is never a problem for you probably. But from what I hear, you know, everyone that's outside of that, it's still decently tricky um, to raise at the current moment. So, and I just I think we're we're still pretty far away from anything that feels like retail fervor or even fund driven fervor. Um, like a lot of the the early starting signs are still feel pretty far out. Um, that said, I, I do, I have like pulled forward my own, I guess, mental model, like for, for when this stuff starts to happen, because I just, I agree with you. Basically, once you hit that psychological point of like, well, I think it's like one big, once Bitcoin starts to get within the spitting distance of its all time high, like people that the fee, the fervor just picks up quite a bit and then it starts the train, you know? Yeah. You just gotta be long, both like everything then I, I like. I think the other thing to to think about too is, um, you know, we have an ETF now. We're it's hard to argue we're not going to be more tied and correlated in some ways to to traditional macro and risk environments. You know, broader, like take take August first uh, to October thirtieth when last year when rates were going higher, equities were correcting. You know, there's about a twelve percent peak to trough correction. Uh, that that those types of events got to be, you know, net negative for, for flows into the ETF. And, and this fast money is not going out the risk curve. You know, the people that are, there's no bid on, on the ARK, ARKK ETF and other kind of junk companies, like people's, people's animal spirits are lower. So like, it's, I'm trying to like balance that with, you know, we have AI breaking, you know, crazy, crazy highs every day. Like, parse how much of that is is just animal spirits but but <clears throat> it's not crypto animal spirits like we're used to in, in bull markets and then that's the main thing to me is we might you know, like we don't need price can go up without going in a par parabola like it's just we're so used to and acclimated to these like ridiculously you know covid where they double the money supply and the price goes bonkers in like six months you know like the thing can just two x, three x, like the next two or three years, maybe you know, without if there's not this huge monetary impulse or things like that. So, I think that's probably going to confuse people going forward. Is like and just keeping a level head is is important in my mind. On you know, will it look exactly like previous cycles? I think when I think that FOMO and those like parabolas can, but maybe the magnitude or the number of them, like. I think all those things can change just because there's more, there's more um, like knock on effects from, from traditional markets now with the ETF. So it, I'm trying to keep that, those two mindsets balanced. Um, but look, new, new, new coin basically, right? When a new coin gets, new chart, people in crypto say, when a new coin gets launched on exchange and uh, that's what we got with the ETF. So, so don't fade it. Yeah, I think, I mean, those aren't incompatible views. I mean, for everything needs to be binary for people in crypto. It's like, this is either going to the moon or it's going, and I agree with you. I think it's not a change, by the way. This is a continuation yeah. of something, a trend that's been happening for the last decade, which is right. that these boom bust cycles get less pronounced each time and the activity and capital gets dispersed across other assets. Like if you, you could, you could see this in the 
Bitcoin dominance chart. You could see this in peak to trough returns for Bitcoin across each cycle. And you could just intuit it from the law of large numbers, right? Like, yeah, if Bitcoin went up as much as it did during the 2011 cycle, it'd be the most valuable asset on earth times 10. You know, I, that, so there's just a law of large numbers effect here. And I, I do think like the ETFs uh, on a long time horizon will be vault dampening because mm -hmm. the next incremental dollar moving into these ETFs is not a retail fast money uh you know type dollar it's a it's a passive structural dollar and the behavior of even people that are trading around the etfs right like the the people that are trading the etfs they're they're much more mean reverting on the margin now right it's not like oh let me push and pump this thing higher it's like oh this thing went ran up 10 percent in a week it's probably going to go down so uh, it, there's just the the combination of all of this stuff just points to less price appreciation but more steady probably better risk adjusted price appreciation in the majors. And you're just going to get much more dispersion in activity across alts. Mm -hmm. is what I Yeah, no, that's that's right. And when you have the when you have a more stable ecosystem, it's actually much, much. It's a huge positive for everybody else. Like it like it maybe for the degen traders, it's it's less positive because it dampens their vol, but uh, it makes the industry more sustainable long term. You don't have these massive you know, think of our businesses, right? When when crypto prices fall, naturally everything in in the ecosystems activity falls with it, and and that's not how you have a mature industry. So on the whole, it's just massively positive. Hey everyone, we'll be back to the program in just a moment, but before we return, wanted to let you know about Das London. Das London is the largest institutionally focused conference in crypto, hosted by Blockworks. But I wanted to give you an update because we are now ten times oversubscribed. For this conference. So the bad news is we have actually got to lower, as much as I love you guys, the listeners, we've got to lower our discount rate to margin 10. That's going to get you 10% off. I would highly recommend that you do that soon because you might have noticed ticket prices have gone up 200 pounds and they're only going up from here. And I actually can't guarantee that we're going to have this discount rate forever. Since we last talked, we've had a whole bunch of new great speakers sign up for the conference. We've got Brad Garlinghouse as a keynote. We've got Pascal Gauthier as a keynote. We've got new speakers signed on from Goldman Sachs from Franklin Templeton, uh, from some of the largest family offices and allocators based out of the Europe. So Theta Capital Management, L1 Digital. And actually on day one of the conference, we're going to be having an investor day, which is a Chatham House Rules hosted by some of the largest investors in crypto. Then the other thing that happened is we've got our VIP tickets that just went live. There are only 60, but we've actually had a bunch of them that just sold out even in one day. So if you want to be a VIP at the conference, make sure you get your ticket. And again, use code MARGIN10 uh, to hang out with me and Mark, uh, March 18th to the 20th in sunny London. Cheers. I, th I think now it's, uh, and maybe we're, I'm transitioning to early this topic, but the ETTF is is something that I'm like, yeah, I was that is a huge, 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 huge date. Like before it was kind of like, all right, it's kind of a narrative of, okay, the, we're flipping to the ETH ETF after the, the BTC one gets launched. But now the, the the stakes on that, I think, are just so big for the the performance of ETH over the next 12 months. Because um, truly, if, if you don't, if, if we're seeing this magnitude of flows that an ETF opens up and and you don't get that for, for the other major asset, it, it kind of disadvantages it. So I, that's something I'm trying to, you know, come to a view on uh, or some conviction on over the coming weeks. I think the ETF is going to be, the ETH ETF is going to get approved and it's going to be successful. So for folks who are following along on video, what you can see here is the chart of ETH, the ETH BTC ratio, which people sort of look at as a, as a measure of relative strength, um, ETH Bitcoin. And you can see it looks like it actually bottomed on this date, like right before the ETH the Bitcoin ETFs went live, which is funny, right? Like that's not what you would necessarily expect. Um, and uh, I think I, like my my base case has been the way that I see it playing out, but you, you correct me or push back if you see it a different way, is that the market will look at what the success of the Bitcoin ETF and there's going to be, they'll extrapolate some degree of similar success to Ethereum, uh, to the Ether ETF. Uh, ETH is still has less liquidity than Bitcoin. And it's got this weird reflexive price thing going on with the burn, which I actually think the burn is overstated in terms of the impact it has on price, but uh, still there is a burn. And 
you know, right now there's a lot of ETH questions and within the crypto community, right? Is it is it just getting squeezed in between Bitcoin versus Solana or what's its narrative? Is it all, you know what TradFi thinks about that? They don't give two shits about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's just- <laughs> it's it the is tokenization just a, coin. Right. I, I mean, there's a couple of different driving things, which is, okay, is it just going to be Bitcoin or is it going to be a basket of cryptos? Like, I feel like with the rise of passive, like people like baskets better than bets on one asset. Everyone says, I don't really understand this. Give me the top, give me the top five or whatever. I feel like there's probably a chance where indexation makes much more sense than it ever has in the past. And I just think people are going to, I just think people are not going to overthink it. So yeah, I think it's going to be a big success for the most part. I, I agree. If it, if it comes, I, uh, you can't fade it. Like, I mean, BlackRock, it, it's just logical, right? Like <laughs> they just launched this product. It's the number one ETF of all time. And this industry, they've, it was the first thing they ever put their hands on in the industry. Like it's super logical that, okay, what's next? ETH done. What else? You know, tokenization of our funds and any other way, you know, they're already heavily ingrained in, in stable coins with, with USDC. Obviously they do a lot there. They're investors in circle. So they'll see some um, liquidity on that investment with, with Circle IPOs this year. Uh, yeah, there's like, there's no way, it's like everybody else. Like we did, we just had this way, like years ago where you touch the space and you're like, damn, like this, it's like using a smartphone, I'm not going back. Um, where, I, where I shake out though, is I'm not convinced the ETF is gonna happen. I think that um, the way that they approve the Bitcoin ETF with, with that, I'm missing the line, but the the correlation basically between the, the spot and futures trading activity that they could point to over a sufficiently a reasonably sufficient amount of time um, was interesting. They didn't really budge on some of the other points that Grayscale and others were making and in, in, in why it should have been approved previously. So I'm a little more cautious on it getting approved. Um I would need to see like some, some positive uh, like SEC interaction with issuers and things like that. Maybe maybe the Coinbase SEC ruling helps a little if that's positive, but that's that's litigation. That's not from the SEC directly. So, but if it happens, it's I, I think it's going to be a huge success. And regardless, like that chart you showed, right? Like it's bottomed or it looks pretty bottomy, and that's despite these monster inflows to, to the BTC ETF. And, and I assume we're not going up to billion dollar inflows a day or something like that, right? Like I assume yeah. like this is, this is kind of peakish. So, you know, just it, like you said, the, the amount that's required to move the needle on the ETH is, is so much less, you know, maybe 50% or something um, to have an impact. So I, I, I think there's, I'm working on conviction to get, I think there's probably an ETH move here over the next month, you know, you have a lot of positive things in March with with some of the upgrade and and things. So, I, I would imagine people turn their attention with the Bitcoin ETF flow slow down. Yeah, um, you know, I know we've talked about this as well, but like one one, this has been a bit of a funny cycle. I, th I actually think Solana messed a lot of people up this cycle because it had that weird idiosyncratic run. But everything else has been just textbook crypto cycles. Mm -hmm. Like uh, everything sells off, Bitcoin sells off the least. Uh, Bitcoin dominance runs, Bitcoin moves first. I mean, that's where we are, right? It's like Bitcoin is now moving first. And yeah. this, is, this is a sign of a super healthy uh, start to a crypto. Uh, Pull up that Bitcoin dom chart if you if you have it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Trading sure. view. That, that's sure. another interesting one. I mean, it looks a lot like an upside down ETH BTC chart, um, but it, it looks pretty toppish to me. I think it's just, it's it's a pretty classic it's a pretty classic yeah. move at this point. And um, I don't know, this is a this is a, a psychological shift that I think it takes a little while for people to to get to, towards as well, which is, you know, you just went through a bear market, you had to question everything, all the stuff that you thought was great sucked. Um, and you've, you've, you've put a very um, critical look at what we're doing. And the, and the benefit to that is that we came up with a whole bunch of innovations. We've shipped a bunch of product. Uh, the industry is much further ahead now than it was two years ago. But uh, the stuff that mattered these last two years is not going to be what matters coming forward. And you know, probably the next big 
wave narrative wave in crypto is going to be this AI coin wave, um, you know, just getting the biggest narrative from the stock market and merging it with crypto is, I think, going to end up being pretty positive. Um, so, yeah, that's area I've not been, I've trained, like I played some of them. A friend of mine showed me uh, NOS, NOS at four cents. I bought it and, and paper handed it after like a three or four X. And now it's like a 200 X. So that's, that's the extent of my, and, and like render, I think like it's easy to bet on the bigger ones. It's like, that's where funds and play, people can play once, once they get of scale um, without purely, purely degen kind of all coining. But yeah, yeah, man, if, if, if the equity markets stay hot driven by AI, like, <laughs> you know, crypto is going to be right behind it. Yeah. Um, it absolutely is. Uh, and actually maybe we can, you know, close on moving past your script to get your take on what's going on in, on the macro side of things. Uh, so we had a, we had a hot CPI print come in. It's looking like core PCE is going, that was headline. So CPI, um, headline came in hot on a month over month basis. It looks like core or PCE is going to be hot as well. Um, I guess the question is, does that a, do you see a resurgence in inflation, which certainly would matter? Uh, yeah. Like, what are your thoughts on inflation overall right now or the general state of macro? So the reason I, I got skeptical on um, on risk, like maybe end of, end of Jan, was, was uh, largely a yields play. Like, if you look February to March of last year, August to October of last year, or, or even July to October of last year, um, the corrections we had previously, it's all on the back of rising yields and a, and a normalizing yield curve. Um, but the market just isn't caring right now. I think that that's a sign of itself. Like we bottomed on the 10 year in like three, eight or whatever in late December and we're up to four, three. And I think like there was co bigger concerns about the economy and the strength there, um, which you know, if, if rates are, are mooning and the economy is weakening, then that creates problems. I think where we're at now is building pretty decent consensus in, is, in terms of the underlying strength of, of the economy. I mean, manufacturing, freight, like employment wages, new orders, like everything's sort of inflecting up. It's, it's pretty bottomed. And then you have the election year, the stimulus bias that holds. Like, I think that's where you can have the highest conviction is, is the economic strength. And, and, uh, like kudos to like the treasury and fed, they've, they've continued to thread the needle in terms of supplying the market with ample liquidity and, and quelling people's concerns about, about what, what the data actually shows. So yeah, that, that's where I think it's tough to fade risk here, but I, I do think at some point it'll matter. Um, it's probably maybe you know, when you get above four five or get four seven five closer to 5% again. So it, it's tough to predict on the timing side, but, um, you know, I, I think like the long risk short treasuries is, is probably the best position to be like if timing the equity down, down move is, is tough. So uh, I think you could be pretty hedged by just, uh, shorting long duration treasuries. Yeah. Um, the interplay here between the Fed and the Treasury has been super interesting. I they're they're the anything. same entity at this point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, certainly, like the like Yellen. Yeah, people. Sometimes people are critical of her. I mean, she seems to be like a pretty solid, savvy operator from from where I sit. Uh, yeah, I think threading the needle is the exact right way to say it, and it does feel like fiscal's in. You know, whether or not, however separate you think those entities are fiscal is in the driver's seat here. And one of the things that I was even trying to think through is like, I mean, clearly like this doesn't matter an enormous amount. Like we've actually done a decent amount of pushing rate cuts out. I don't know if you saw this headline, but Larry Summers is now talking about there's a decent possibility that there might be a hike instead of a cut. Yeah. And I just don't think the market cares very much right now. And it's, it's that so $2 trillion dollar deficit, not, you know, another 50 or hundred basis points in rate hikes. Like who cares? I'm not sure it matters. I think I love crypto because it, it gives you things that, like, you know, we talk about Ponzi's and crypto um, or you talk about token inflation and, and these are like financial concepts that, that are just 
brought from a different different wor- world. And um, if you just think about it, right? Like what's going on? What's going on is the government is inflating the supply of, of treasuries and dollars at a rate that is historically very significant. And those dollars and treasuries are falling in the hands of, of people that like to buy assets and, and, and it's falling in an outsized proportion to the people that buy assets, right? The rich, the 1%, the people who have money in treasuries that are earning 5% and at a disproportion to the people buying goods, but it's still flowing to them. Uh, they're getting it through the, the effects of the government spending and the paving the roads and building bridges and, and the jobs. And so they're going out and they're spending 80, 90% of their income and, and keeping the price of oil and food and eggs and milk supplied uh, so that, you know, there's this baseline like goods inflation. And then you have like the services and asset inflation that just keeps roaring because everybody's getting more dollars, you know, that the government's creating. So until they like change something drastically, it, you know, the risk assets are, are, are going to continue, but there is a point of where it's unsustainable. Um, we just clearly haven't reached that point. And that point could be five years out. Like you can always read a lot of macro doom and gloom. Um, but you know, it, it, who knows when it happens. So, you know, crypto's in a good spot, I think with, with that plus the, the micro. And who knows how it happens. There's a, there's a, I'm actually three episodes out of four through this mini series on Britain in 1974. And the UK in 1974 was not a place where you really wanted to be. Uh, it was, you know, to set the scene of what was going on back then, you know, post World War II, Britain went from this world superpower to being, yeah, way the, the perception and the reality is that they fell way off the world stage, right? In terms of their overall influence, still a great place to live, you know, great people. Um, plug Das London in, in March. <laughs> uh, we're going there. But overall, like the scene was that, okay, you know, we are less important than we used to be. And they were facing this crippling, you know, this was around the time of the uh, the oil embargo. And there was an enormous amount of inflation and, and stagflation was happening over in the US, but it was much, much worse over in the UK. And yeah, they the rate of inflation that they were experiencing for a whole bunch of different political reasons um, was like five times what what it was in the rest of Europe, for instance. And these guys, the 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 podcast called "The Rest of History." I'll plug it, and I plug it all the time on the show. But uh, you know, they talked about who benefited in this situation because one of the big dynamics back then was the union workers, right? And that the the way this story ends is Margaret Thatcher comes in and breaks the back of the unions. Uh, right, the enemy from within is what they were called at the time. But these unions would negotiate thirty percent pay hikes for their members, um, and so uh, what the the end result of what all of this was like who who benefited from this situation? No one ultimately, uh, because the rich ended up getting taxed. The top tax bracket went up to eighty four percent. Investment income went up to ninety eight percent. Ninety eight percent. Can you imagine that? <laughs> So anyway, so, if you, yeah. yeah, this is that's, for anyone making the over the equivalent of two hundred thousand dollars in in that times money. Um, so it's not like the crazy rich. Uh, basically, if you were even moderately well off, you were giving all of your gains back to taxes. Uh, if you were the member of one of these unions that was getting a a, a price, or your your wages were getting hiked this much, you did pretty well. You were keeping your head above water, even though like food prices and stuff was going up a lot. But if you were on a fixed pension you were screwed, like that wasn't getting adjusted. If you were yeah. a student, uh, or if you just weren't a member of one of these particular unions, there were like hundreds of them that were all negotiating this stuff. And that that is the end game for what you're describing here. That's why this is shitty that this is all happening because it's like, oh yeah, fiscal, great. Like stocks go up, like I love my crypto, but it's like, this is what's coming. I mean, this is how they always reset it at the end of the day. So this is not good for anyone. Uh, is yeah, I mean, the... And we're far from that. Like, that's the thing is like, you know, we saw like this, yes, last year was a pretty interesting year when, when all these unions renegotiated like UPS and like the auto and, you know, there were some large, like 20 to 40% like wage increases over multi-year periods. Um, but as long as like the monetary, you know, just kind of assets continue to get bailed out, it's hard for that completely, that, that, uh, momentum to, to shift to the the labor and the worker side. I think like maybe what what you should watch is like the the ratio of like MBAs to 
trade degrees or something. And when like trade degree starts like two, three Xing its growth like year over year, which might come in like five years, um, that's probably like maybe when things get figured out. But uh, yeah, like you can be a UPS driver and be making more than a lot of the recent MBA grads. So once once that, that skews the other way, I think uh, it's probably the time to get cautious, but it can go on. And, and I think the election year narrative is is something that's hard to fight because it's like true. So it's a narrative, but like all their jobs, like the percentage of incumbents that win when, when the economy is strong is just like undeniable. So let's be honest, like they're going to do everything in their power to, to support markets and, and assets and make sure the economy is strong into the election. So um, it is a narrative, but like there's truth behind it. And, and I think like, until until further notice like dips dips will be bought yep i've got i'm i'm with you on that and you know the other reason why this end game that i described as far away is i do think populism is on the rise but i mean it has to get really bad before yeah yeah we had joseph wang on the show a couple uh, a couple weeks ago and he just described as like you could just see the culture among politicians of like giving away handouts does if it's biden with the uh, you know, with uh, forgiving student loans, which by the way, I think student loans are criminal. Like those, we have to, we have to fix the way that those get done. That's, but it's still a handout. And on for Trump, it's the corporate tax cut. So it's just like, whoever's it just, whoever's getting the handout changes. But yeah. People are still getting handouts. You know, no one's, no one, no politicians are getting up there saying, <laughs> yeah. need some austerity here, friends. <laughs> uh, so, and it's probably not going to happen. And frankly, I don't even think it would work anyway. If we tried it now, we probably just got to, you know, keep on the track that we're running. Yeah, the 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 student loan thing is something that I was surprised to get more attention. I mean, that was as a direct result of that. We saw it was like the largest victory and in, in turnout and in, in young voters like in at any election ever. I mean, it was is about as direct transmission of, of paying for votes as you could possibly get. Um, but it kind of like whatever, like, it's just like, oh, it's an executive order and like, who really cares? And now it's obviously being fought tooth and nail and in courts and, and whether it's upheld or not, we'll see. Um, yeah, they, you can expect a lot more of those shenanigans going into November. Like, I mean, everybody every year is, it's the most important election in the history, right? Like this is the biggest fall since 07, right? Like there's all these like crazy historical uh, hyperboles and, and those are just going to increase. So. I guess maybe you just buy Trump coin and 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 close your eyes and sell it in November or something. He's got his own NFTs. Honestly, if you were a betting man, maybe you maybe you buy some of those NFTs, but I'm not gonna do that, I don't think. But anyway, Quinn, this has been a ton of fun, man. If folks wanna follow you, find out more info, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, just go on Twitter. There's some Substack uh notes I like to put out here and there and uh but Twitter's Twitter's the spot and uh hopefully back here. Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. All right, partner. See you soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Mike.